Hello, everybody. My name is Amy Chester. I am the Managing Director of Rebuild by Design. Welcome to Resilience by Design University. Um, Resilience by Design University is really, to be honest, an experiment. There are a number of people who came together after Rebuild by Design who are all professors at different universities in America and wanted to continue the conversation and to think about how best to teach resilience to their students in an interdisciplinary way. So we are testing by um, coming together today and doing a number of panels that I think you guys will be very excited about. We wanted to thank um, specifically some of our close um, friends at Penn Design, Columbia, and NYU IPK, which were the core group that organized today. But we also partnered with the Stevens Institute, New Jersey Institute for Technology, the New School, Yale Art and Architecture, and 100 Resilient Cities. And as always, we want to thank Rockefeller Foundation, who is funding us to be here today. I'm sure you guys have already downloaded your Convene app in one of these devices. If you haven't yet, please do it, because here's the thing. Not only will it connect you to the program and the panel discussions, but you can actually have the contact information for the panelists. So when a panel is over, you don't have to run out the door, run down that professor and ask them a question. You can actually reach out to them afterwards. You can also connect to LinkedIn, so you can connect to one another if you want to I don't know, go on a date or <laughs> talk about what you heard today. That's up to you. But the most important is that Raka, who did a, a tremendous job organizing today, will be sending out notifications throughout the day of when panels are starting, when lunch is beginning, and most important, when our cocktail hour is starting. So please remember to hang out a little while afterwards and have a chat and a drink with us. As I said before, this day is an experiment, um, and we really want to hear your feedback. And you can, can use that Convene app to give us your feedback of all of the panel discussions. What did you wish that you heard a little more of? Who could have also been on a panel to discuss something like that? So please, um, whether you're doing it during the panel discussions or afterwards, we really do want to hear from you. So please take the time to give us that feedback. So without further ado, I want to jump right into the program and introduce the Dean of Architecture and Planning, Amal Andros, um, who is hosting us today, which we are extremely grateful for. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to welcome everyone uh, here today. And in the interest of time, I'm going to read my introduction, and I have my phone because it's going to be a long, long day. Um, what does climate change? Uh, climate change changes everything, as Naomi Klein has put it, from our understanding of the human impact on the planet under current economic and political conditions, to our settlement patterns and our energy and agricultural models, from our rereading of industrialization and modernization, to the way we envision our future as one species amongst many, Climate change has altered the conceptual coordinates of inhabitation and compli complicated their social frameworks. Now more than ever, there is a clear need to enlist emerging and diverse, hybridized and multifaceted forms of practice and action in a renewed engagement with the world. To do this requires more broadly framing the impact of climate change on various disciplines, bringing together climate and social scientists, engineers and technologists, artists, writers, humanities scholars, lawyers, historians, and importantly, architects, planners, and designers. For architecture in particular, and I mean the expanded notion of architecture, Climate change is at once redefining the discipline, its overlaps and boundaries, while in turn enabling its full rendering through the multiple lenses of the kaleidoscopic qualities of the notion of architecture as a synthetic discipline. So what does climate change for architecture? For over a decade now, for over a decade now already, architecture's engagement with climate change has taken on various forms. Most evidently, the notion of architecture as technology has led to innovation in energy systems, material performance, and energy regulations and certification, consolidating the building as the optimal frame through which to regulate architecture's impact on carbon emissions. 
architecture as infrastructure has ex expanded on Team 10's building as urbanism to consider the intertwining of large urban and ecological systems now tied to the smaller material scale of building parts. The strategy has offered us new forms of continuity between the urban and the natural, leading to new typologies such as the landform building and new forms of strategic infrastructural interventions and ecological urbanisms. Architecture as visualization has intensified drawing and ushered in new powerful mapping practices critically engaged with the nature of data. Lines are no longer drawn as walls, but as vectors rendering the interconnected and scalar relationships of networks of exchange manifest ex across extensive landscapes and territories. Drawing climate change intricate web of causes and effects across geographical as well as historical scales, these new forms of visualizations converge planetary politics such as resource extraction, forced migrations, labor movements, conflicts, and high-speed urbanization with the spatial and temporal transformation of our built and unbuilt environments. Architecture as embodied energy and as register of externalities has refocused the field on the material, now connecting buildings to the vast territories and scales, spatial as well as temporal, of their making. As architecture registers and manifests the material life it is made of, rendering legible the complexity of its systems, buildings become quite powerful ecologically. Finally, climate change has opened up new lines of inquiry for architecture as discourse and as political engagement. If architecture has long been seen as strictly anthropocentric, design thinking is now considering other species, plants, and animals as equally entitled to shelter and livable environments, undoing the age-old separation of nature from culture and pointing instead to the implication of all things in the production of contemporary life. In many ways, climate change has already transformed architecture and all of the disciplines of the built environment, intensifying their expanded fields to focus certain directions while opening up further territory for critical engagement and for new modes of practice. Architecture was never a single object. Today, it is more than ever a form of knowledge that could enable the convergence of physical space and historical time with an expanded notion of its subjects as well as the sense of it being an expanded object, a network, and a field all at once. And yet, despite this promise of convergence, climate change has still to undo the constructed oppositions between discourse and practice, between art versus life, aesthetics versus performance, and communication versus technology which have plagued feel, the field for decades, at least in the West, and which we continue to find ourselves in. This continued polarization leaves architecture's possibility for a renewed and more meaningful engagement with the world unsatisfying, and devoid of the boundary-defying thinking that is occurring in other fields. One of those fields is that of history, which the scholar and historian Deepesh Chakrabarti, who gave the keynote uh, lecture last, uh, uh, last semester for our climate change and the scales of environment uh, conference has invited us to consider uh, the disciplinary limitations of history in the face of climate change. In his address, Shakabarti shared with us how he came to find his framework as a historian insufficient. A more enabling frame he invited us to consider would allow one to first hold together our conflicts and differences with the consciousness of being collectively an endangered species amongst others. Two, it would invite us to cope with the problem of scale and enable the thinking across vastly differing scales of time and space. And three, it would imply not the certainty of risk management, but life, and in our case, design, as a form of engagement and action faced with uncertainty and our inability to model it. And so it seems that what is at once important but also different about this symposium today, relative to others that have been organized before, is that it is intended not only to open up the question of urban resilience in the face of climate change, but the question of how climate change is changing our respective disciplines, frames of references, pedagogical approaches and modes of practice fundamentally and at their very core. 
It is doing so by answering, in some ways, some of Chakrabarti's invitations. First, there's a sense of urgency in finding ways to think and work across disciplinary differences, an urgency to collaborate across expertise, across institutions and schools. There is a need to engage with the problem of scale and undo the scalar divisions that have, in fact, structures, structured the divisions between our disciplines. Technology, the scale of material and systems. Architecture, the scale of building. Urban design, the scale of a neighborhood. Urban planning, the scale of a city. Preservation, the scale of the past. Real, real estate development, the scale of the future, etc. As Kuhl has his seminal 20th century manifesto, SML Excel, cemented, we are fundamentally divided by the problem of scale, even as it is precisely what we need to overcome to consider thinking and designing across what Kate Orff has termed scales of environment. And finally, this symposium is inviting us to reimagine how we think, plan, design, live, again, not for certainty, but for uncertainty through redundant systems, layered approaches, strategic interventions, tactical urbanisms, integrated and responsive feedback loops, and how uncertainty should shake up our most stable beliefs, the Vitru Vitruvian architectural firmitas whose ground has been rendered porous from under its foundations. As rising waters redraw edge conditions, as migrants erase territorial boundaries, as time is stretched to that of geological transformation, and as seemingly endless flows of information recast our concept of context, there's an urgency to move beyond the stability and certainty offered by oppositions, to consider instead weaving together uncertain grounds and positions from which to nevertheless project new forms of knowledge, of engagement, and indeed of architecture, of planning, and of design. And so before I invite Marilyn Taylor to the podium, I wanted to share a small anecdote that says much about where we were and I hope where we're going. The symposium confirms um, where we might be going. Uh, it was last November at the AIA Dean's Roundtable at the Center for Architecture here in New York. Marilyn and I were there amongst other deans and I asked why should the schools continue to compete rather than find new ways to collaborate in the face of today's challenges. To which Bob Stern answered, because there's a train that connects the East Coast from Princeton to Yale, Harvard, Columbia, Penn, etc., and students are choosing at what stop to get off. <laughs> Clearly, Bob hadn't realized that the world had gone global some time ago and that the East Coast was sinking. Marilyn, in contrast, joined me in echoing the need for all of us to come together if we are to change things. And so, while I can't take much credit uh, for this coming together today, I wanted to really thank first Marilyn, but also Mat uh, Matthias Bau and Kate Orff and Eric Kleinberg, who have masterminded these two incredible days. And please welcome Marilyn Taylor, who's been an inspiration and a pioneer for so many years already. That story is really true. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, everyone. It's such a, such a pleasure to be here. Uh, Amal, thank you for setting the pace, uh, as well as the content of the day. And hi, Kate, how are you? It's great to see you here as well. Uh, I, too, am going to, in this academic house, observe the tradition of reading my remarks, but I will try to do it with my usual enthusiasm. So uh, hang on here. Uh, so uh, I, indeed, I'm Marilyn Taylor. I have been, for the last seven and a half years, Dean of the School of Design. Uh, I wrote in here the home, uh, well, school design at the University of Pennsylvania, and therefore the home of Ian McCarg. He got a lot right. His disdain for cities is fortunately something we have passed beyond. But most importantly, uh, I'm here today with Matthias Bau, a visiting professor at Penn Design and the recipient of the first ever Rockefeller Foundation Urban Resilience Fellowship, uh, a grant we were thrilled to receive in December 2014. It is that grant and Matthias's commitment and design intelligence that, in my mind, bring us here together today. And I must say, back with so many of you with whom we have coordinated and conversed and pushed each other forward, it's just absolutely spectacular to be part of this group again. We could not be at this significant point in our grant 
without the partnership of three other institutions and the contributions of many, many other outstanding design leaders in practice and the academy. Thank you, Eric Kleinenberg of the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU for so successfully broadening our vision and our expectations. Thank you, Rockefeller Foundation, 100 Resilient Cities and Rebuild by Design by encouraging and supporting big ideas and large aspirations for resilience thinking. And thank you, Amal, for your wonderful opening and for welcoming us to Columbia today and to Kate Orff for continuing to invest your really extraordinary talent in building resilience and, and offering compelling design solutions one at a time and over and over again. So to further introduce our topic, as Matthias says, he's Dutch after all, resilience is a big topic for designers. First, because resilience helps us deal with such issues as climate change and poverty. The term is embraced by philanthropy and governments as an important goal, and we need more of their resources to work with us. It is also important because the resilience lens helps us understand and approach our city and our environment in their full complexity. Designers are, in principle, good in engaging complexity. Our visual tools help with analysis and communication and create a space for conversation. Our design tools can help show and address and solve conflicts. We can spar and develop unorthodox creative solutions. Designers are integrators. Perhaps that's why Christine Morris, the first person to greet me today, Chief Resilience Officer of Norfolk, Virginia, uh, recently said that, quote, she never enters a room without a designer on her side. Yay, Christine, thank you. If we, as designers, continue to develop our tools for engaging resilience and complexity, we will have more agency in helping to shape our cities. Resilience by Design University is a network of design schools who want to take up this challenge. If you're not a member, now's the time to join. So as to format, the event today here at Columbia, tomorrow at NYU IPK, is the first enactment of what will become a fundamental course in designing for resilience. We plan to incorporate it at graduate level design schools and to teach it potentially to incoming mayors, deputy mayors, CROs, regional leaders, and others in whose hands important decisions about resilience frameworks and investments will be made. The event has three parts. This morning in two panels, we will deal with some essential concepts. In the afternoon, the two panels will focus on tools. Tomorrow in a workshop, a prototyping session, so to speak, we will work on the integration of all we learned in a number of case studies brought forward by 100 resilient cities. Our goal for these two days is to understand together whether and how such a fundamentals course of study can work. Panels and workshops have been set up such that they cover the territory we think is important for the course, and we very much hope that you will help us evaluate this in real time by engaging in the conversation. It's an iterative process, as Yogi Berra would say over and over again. Resilience theory teaches us that big plans are often best made through small prototypes and iterations thereof that can be replicated and scaled. Resilience by design follows the same logic. It started as a conversation from Penn Design among Matthias, Ellen Nysis, Cindy Sanders, Anu Mathur, and myself, and it has now grown with others in the Rebuild by Design network. What followed on has been exchanges in each other's classes and reviews and the idea to develop a course of study and application together. So today is, in a sense, the first iteration of the course, hopefully a minimum viable product, as they call it in software development, will emerge. We are really happy, as it shows here, and I'll take the time to call you out, that Stevens Institute, Yale University, and JIT have joined our network, and that 100 Resilient Cities has proven to be among our other great partners. We hope in, that in the near future, the network will continue to grow, and also to grow internationally. So finally, our expectations for today. 
Our intent for today is that we not only discuss resilience and the essential role that design can have in building resilience, but also address the question put forward by Matthijs, how do we teach this, and possibly how, in fact, does resilience force us to rethink the design school? Here's the starting point. Rebuild by Design started, us on, started on the strong read of Secretary John, Sean Donovan and his relationship with the President of the United States. It is sustained today by the strength of its ideas. Resilience by Design is the next step. It is an opportunity that is by necessity inclusive and collective. We hope that today and tomorrow will provide the responses, the inflections, and yes, the sparks that will allow our movement to grow and our belief in the power of resilient thinking to flourish. Thank you all very much.